My name is Sin Q, and to my comrades I am known as Sin. I am a black man and a representative of black people. I hold the rank of General Field Marshal in the United Federated Forces of the Symbionese Liberation Army. My name is Faiza, and I am a freedom fighter in an information intelligence unit of the United Federated Forces of the Symbionese Liberation Army. Greetings to the people. This is Tico speaking. This is Yolanda speaking. Greetings of profound love to all comrades in the concentration camps of fascist America and to all the children. This is Information Intelligence Unit 4. My name is Jelena, and I am a general in the Symbionese Liberation Army. We have declared revolutionary war upon you, the enemy of the people. Death, Death to the, the fascist, fascist insect, insect that preys upon, upon the life, life of the people. people. Mom, Dad, I'm with a combat unit that's armed with automatic weapons. I grew up in Pensacola, Florida, up on the Gulf of Mexico. It was a typical kid's life at that time. I was born in 1949, so I was growing up in the 50s. I grew up watching Zorro and the Swamp Fox, you know, which was about the American Revolution. Robin Hood, I mean, all these tales of swashbucklers and people who were fighting against the government. I, really thought that uh, I would end up being an astronaut. I went to the University of Florida for engineering. I thought that would be my way to get to be an astronaut. When I got to college, I ran into a whole new world. The thing that you remember growing up was we saved the world from Hitler. And then you turn around and we're being Hitler. You see this every night and it's just like, oh my God, you know, it's like, what's going on here? to the war in Vietnam on the campuses and also in the nation. Uh, as far as uh, this kind of activity is concerned, uh, we expect it. However, under no circumstances will I be affected whatever by it. I was pretty militant. I helped shut down the college because I was a student then at UC Berkeley. It was almost like a kid that decided their parents were just disgusting people. That's, I, I know that's a weird way to sum it up, but we just felt like there was no future. It was way too extreme. The difference between what was really going on and what was bandied about in school. I mean, we were just running rampant throughout the world and just lying like hell about it. And then, then Kent State happened and I was shocked just like everybody else. Especially everyone on all the campuses. Why don't you fire on us? Open fire like you did in Kent. 
then I felt like, in no uncertain terms, that people like me were being declared the enemy by the government of the United States. I don't think that most of the young people involved who considered themselves part of the counterculture saw themselves so much as revolutionaries or renegades as people think they did or as the establishment kept accusing them of being. They actually saw themselves, if they did not admit it as such, as patriots. Most everybody that I ever knew that was a radical were go-getters in high school. I was a national science finalist. I, you know, had a gigantic IQ and all this, and most everybody did. You know, it was all these high achievers. We were just shocked. It just got to the point where I felt like this thing is totally out of control. The country is totally out of control. It's being run by criminals. It's being run by just total right-wingers who have no respect for the Constitution or anything else. That's the way I felt when I left and went to California. I didn't necessarily think that I would ever live to see a revolution. It seemed like it was more revolutionary, you know, in the late 60s than it was by the time I got to Berkeley. We were pulling out of Vietnam. A lot of people were going, you know, well, everything's over now. We'll go back to college. And I mean, it wasn't over at all. The same stuff was still going on, you know. The same criminals were still, murderers and stuff, were still running the government, you know. Preserve and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. I couldn't believe it. That Nixon got re-elected in 72. I couldn't believe that this guy got re-elected. I just felt like, you know, we got to keep something going. One of the things I did that other people got involved in was show these films, political films, about what was going on in the world. events in this film actually took place in a South American country. State of Siege. One of the groups that I was really, you know, I really liked, and it's, I guess it's back to the old Robin Hood and Zorro thing, was the two Pomaros down in Uruguay. State of Siege, I did see that. If you consider yourself a revolutionary, if you want to change things, and I thought, well, these guys got it figured out. And Che, of course, I thought he was great. He was from Bolivia. He was down in Cuba helping the Cubans. Che, Che! Superhero to some, villain to others. His battle cry is heard round the world. Che lives. Only Sharif, with his dramatic force and amazing physical likeness to Che, could play the part. It's funny how all these things happen, but that's where Willie and I met Bill and Emily and Joe is in one of these films. Willie was kind of like the catalyst. Willie was the one that all these different people met. Willie was like the common denominator. Willie studied anthropology at Berkeley and it was actually through Berkeley that he got into going to prisons from some class, some um, anthropology class. I think that my and the people around me that I knew had such a total distrust of this country at that point that, you know, San Quentin, Vietnam was the same thing.
I was interested in the prisons, actually. And when I found out that Willie and them were going, then I went. So w Willie came, you know, I think Willie's the one who started, but I mean, there were discussions about, well, you know, what about it? We know there are people in prison that we don't think should be there, you know. You know, what are we willing to do about that, you know? Yeah, we can visit them, we can try to get people to, you know, donate money, we can try to find lawyers to help them and stuff, but what else are we, are we willing to do? You know, and there was talk about, you know, well, what if somebody escaped, you know, or what if we could help somebody escape, you know. And, and uh, you know, so we started talking along those lines. By then, every black prisoner in California prisons was regarded in one way or another as a political prisoner, which had a bit of truth connected to it, but a whole lot of romantic bullshit as well. The idea that made black prisoners at the time so-called political prisoners was that they had been denied sufficient opportunity in society and had reached out to take their share. The Freeze wasn't just some criminal. I mean, he wasn't some guy who was just like some pimp or some dope dealer from day one. The Freeze had been married, he had kids, he worked full time. It's just I think he couldn't live the American uh, dream, the thing you're seeing on TV. He couldn't do it just by working. So he also became a thief. You know, I liked the guy. I liked him. Willie took DeFreeze over to Ms. Moon, Ms. Moon's house, to hide him out. He got transferred over to Nancy Perry's. So DeFreeze and Nancy and Ms. Moon, they were living out in Concord. You got your very own escaped convict? I mean, come on. I mean, if there was status in knowing black political prisoners, there was one hell of a lot of status within the so-called revolutionaries and actually being able to hide out an escapee, uh, who would then prove to be, you know, something more than just an escapee. I think that was the, the beginning of it. Uh, probably him and Ms. Moon were the two first members, I would think. Then Russ Little, you know, uh, knew him. I know people want to make DeFreeze a leader or some kind of Manson figure or something like that, but that's just not my experience. You know. It became obvious to us that, you know, what we were really doing was that we were like forming our own little group to be able to respond to things, and be able to do things that were illegal. Well, this forest is wide. It can shelter and clothe and feed a band of good determined men, good swordsmen, good archers, good fighters. Are you with me? <laughs> bought weapons. They weren't militant in any way, or uh, in fact, most of them had decent personalities and uh, nice people. I mean, we didn't have some great plan. We weren't going to like, well, now we'll take the South in uh, 75, and then we'll move into the Midwest in 76. I mean, we didn't, you know, this wasn't, we didn't think we were Mao out there with the Red Army. We practiced, sure. We practice at the gun ranges just like everybody else practices. Our officers arrived immediately, and uh, both Mr. Blackburn and Dr. Forster were transported to Highland Hospital in Oakland, uh, where uh, Dr. Forster. Uh, uh, was pronounced deceased. The murder of Marcus Foster, who was the school superintendent in Oakland, was one of these appalling acts that made no sense whatsoever. Here was the first black school superintendent in the history of Oakland, a good man, suddenly gunned down. Who actually pulled the trigger that killed Foster was Ms. Moon. Nancy was 
supposed to shoot Blackburn. She kind of botched that in the freeze and ended up shooting him with a shotgun. If I recall correctly, I was about to leave the office one day when I stopped to check my mailbox. I looked in and there was this communique sent from the Symbionese Liberation Army saying that they had assassinated Foster. I remember being struck by the fact they said we used cyanide-tipped bullets. I mean, the whole thing sounded ridiculous. Symbionese Liberation Army killing the black school superintendent. Who were these people? We thought for sure it was just some lunatic right-wing fringe. And we just figured Symbionese was like some, uh, you know, white farmers in Rhodesia or something. My name is Faiza, and I am a freedom fighter in an information intelligence unit of the United Federated Forces of the Symbionese Liberation Army. I try to use my mind and my imagination to uncover facts so that when the SLA attacks, it will be in the right place. I remember saying, why? This guy, why would you kill a black guy? Jesus Christ, man. It's like, what? You know, there's black people being killed all over the place, man. You know, if you're going to kill somebody, why in the world would it be him? And as far as DeFreeze was concerned, Foster was the front man for some just horrendous police apparatus that was set up. The issue was ID for high school students. And the funny thing is, is everybody today that's been even, even mildly associated with the SLA, just about everyone has kids and they, all of us want those IDs. That's the funny thing. Ramiro and Russell Little were taken into custody two nights ago when they exchanged shots with a conquered policeman. Before the day was over, Joseph Ramiro had been accused of the murder of Oakland School's chief, Dr. Marcus Foster. Well, they found us in the van. Joe was in a shootout with the cop and everything. As far as they're concerned, man, we're armed and dangerous revolutionaries. Within less than 48 hours, we were in San Quentin prison. I mean, I'd never been arrested before. Ramiro. At the time, we were investigating, and we regarded him as their armorer. That is someone who took care of the weapons. And Little was more of a logistical support person. He was close to DeFreeze and would have been, I think, uh, aware of whatever decision was made to kill Foster. We found Mr. Little's identification at the Sutherland address in Concord that uh, we were working on. We've identified him by witnesses at that location. We also found a map of the scene of the murder at the Oakland Public Schools, uh, showing the location where Dr. Foster had been killed, and the map was identified by the word ambush across the top. Has your investigation uncovered any uh, evidence as to the size of this Liberation Army? No. The only thing I can say is that it has grown day by day. Everybody saw us together all the time. I mean, after we got arrested, man, they were totally tied to us, you know. At that point, you only have two choices. Either just drop out of everything and disappear, or, you know, go into hiding and try to figure out what to do next. And that's what they did. They had massive files on all the heads of all the big international corporations who were involved in overthrowing Chile and everything else that was going on, they were gathering information on all that. They just had some massive investigative research thing going on. The SLA, in its formative time at that point, was looking for targets. Emily Harris worked in the registrar's office at UC Berkeley. So they had a pretty fair uh, knowledge of who was at Berkeley, and they were looking for the right one.
There's been a big kidnapping on the West Coast. The victim is Patricia Hurst, the daughter of newspaper executive Randolph Hearst and a granddaughter of the legendary William Randolph Hearst. Miss Hearst, newspaper heiress and daughter of Randolph Hearst, managing editor of the San Francisco Examiner, is a University of California sophomore. She screamed when the men burst in and started beating her fiancé, 26-year-old Stephen Weed. The young heiress was forced into the trunk of a white car. Her abductors, armed with pistols and a rifle, fired a hail of bullets as they sped away, followed by a second vehicle. Police say the whole thing was carried out with commando-like precision. They said absolutely nothing. They were, they were very militaristic. They, they had it so well planned that they, they needed to say almost nothing to each other. The national uh, media immediately focused on it as a, as a kidnapping case and then understood, you know, the revolutionary aspects of it. Uh, but in effect, what they did was park outside uh, Randolph Hearst's mansion. It was the only place to go. And so they made a story of it to some degree. We arrived at the from the Hearst home in Hillsboro. John? So I'd get calls in the morning saying, who's there? Well, two's here, and so is four, and so is five. I'm seven. Well, you better hang around. And so no one left because the other was there. We had the same questions that everybody else had. Where is this thing going to go? Who are these people? What do they want? The United Federated Forces of the Symbionese Liberation Army, armed with cyanide-loaded weapons, served an arrest warrant upon Patricia Campbell Hearst. All communications from this court must be published in full in all newspapers and all other forms of the media. Failure to do so will endanger the safety of the prisoner. Should any attempt be made by authorities to rescue the prisoner or to arrest or harm any SLA elements, the prisoner is to be executed. And in capital uh, letters under that is death to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people. Right. We heard this stuff, we were locked down in the Adjustment Center in San Quentin. And all this stuff hit the media, and we just couldn't believe it. The heat on us was bad enough, and after that happened, man, it was just really a nightmare. We are now the uh, SLA personified, the premier anti-government terrorists. At that point, they stuck us up on death row in the strip cells up there, and did all kinds of shit, you know. I mean, put us in the gas chamber, did, you know, everything they could think of. But we weren't gonna start changing our tune. We figured we were dead anyway. Why should we snivel our way out of it? Do you have any feelings about your son being moved to death row at San Quentin? Well, I think it was very silly. I mean, under the Constitution, you're innocent and found guilty. He was in the hearing, he hadn't even been brought to trial. So what would you say? Wouldn't you say it was a very silly thing to do? We had read about this, watched movies about it. Now we got to be in Attica, you know, you know, as revolutionaries, no, no less. Now you, you talk about State of Siege in the movie, for example. I mean, that's the way the SLA kind of envisioned it. The kidnap was meant as a prisoner swap. They meant, frankly, uh, to grab Patricia Hearst and trade her for Russ Little and Joe Romero. What we received in the mail today appears to me to be a seven-page statement from the SLA, plus a tape recording which purports to be somebody from the SLA and also the voice of Patricia Hearst. And uh, according to the demands which we'll outline here, uh, it says that all of these things must be publicized in full, which is what we're doing right now. We knew they weren't about to release us because they had Patty Hearst. They realize they're not going to get a prisoner exchange. The next best thing they can do is to, uh, is to create some kind of enormous act. So that's the food giveaway.
We have heard it said that Mr. Hurst wants to save his daughter. We want to save all the children and people. Each Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday for four successive weeks, each person with one of the listed cards can go to publicized stores and pick up their food. The meat, vegetables, and dairy products must be of top quality and an ample supply during all store hours. No, and, and it's, it's as outrageous as they can think of it. I mean, they want... They want the supermarkets emptied and food thrown into the streets. I mean, that's really what it amounted to. Freedom. General Field Marshal C-I-N-S-L-A. And what we're going to play next, as per instructions from the SLA, there's a tape recording from the SLA which purports to contain the voice of, uh, of the kidnapped victim, Patricia Hurst. Mom, Dad, I'm okay. I'm with a combat unit that's armed with automatic weapons. And these people aren't just a bunch of nuts. They've been really honest with me that um, they're perfectly willing to die for what they're doing. And I want to get out of here, but I, the only way I'm going to is if we do it their way. And I just hope that you'll do what they say, Dad, and just do it quickly. And I mean, I hope that this puts you a little bit at ease, so that and that you know that I that I really that I really am all right. Um, I just hope I can get back to everybody really soon. Wednesday. Day in February, and of course, it's the morning after the Hearst family received that letter from the Simeonese Liberation Army was full of very bizarre demands. This morning, an FBI man said that the demand for $300 million worth of free food for people and welfare was, in his words, in the realm of unreasonableness. You sounded a little tired or like you were sedated, but you sounded all right, and I'm sure that the uh, people that have you are telling the truth when they say they're treating you under the Geneva Convention. I just want you to know that I'm going to do everything I can to get you out of there. It's a little frightening because the original demand is what I was afraid of from the beginning, is that one that's impossible to meet. However, in the next 24 or 48 hours, I'll be trying to do my best to come back with some kind of a counteroffer uh, that's acceptable. It's very difficult because I have no one to negotiate with uh, except through a letter that generally comes two or three days later than we expected. Anyway, you can rest assured that your mother and I and all the family will do everything we can to get you out. Tell them not to worry. Nobody's going to bust in on them or start a shoot-up. And you take care of yourself. They waited to see what Hearst would do and did very little work to try to find out what the SLA might do or who the SLA might be. That ominous quiet continues at the Hearst home, and that tense, frustrating wait goes on. We never discussed it as to, should we be doing this? We're, you know, being a mouthpiece for the family. We're recording what they have to say. We're recording what the bad guys are saying, their tapes. We're just sort of being messengers back and forth. We're not, are we really doing our jobs? Greetings to the people and fellow comrade, brothers and sisters. My name is Sin Q, and to my comrades I am known as Sin. I hold the rank of General Field Marshal in the United Federated Forces of the Simbanese Liberation Army. The SLA has arrested the subject for the crimes that her mother and father have by their actions committed against we the American people and the oppressed people of the world. Randolph A. Hearst is the corporate chairman of the fascist media empire of the ultra-right Hearst Corporation. 
which is one of the largest propaganda institutions of this present military dictatorship of the militarily armed corporate state that we now live under in this nation. The primary goal of this empire is to serve and form the necessary propaganda and smokescreen to shield the American people from seeing the realities of the corporate dictatorship which Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford represent. In closing, I wish to say to Mr. Hearst and Mrs. Hearst, I am quite willing to carry out the execution of your daughter to save the life of starving men, women, and children of every race. And if, as you and others so naively believe, that we will lose, let it be known that even in death we will win. For the very ashes of this fascist nation will mark our very graves. There was no doubt they were in control of the situation, no doubt. And no doubt that they had control, again, because they had the girl. They had a Hearst. This is like uncrowned royalty. They kicked off something they had no idea what the ramifications were going to be when they kidnapped her. They did exactly what I, for one, didn't want to do. And we were parked in front, and we started out with cars. Then we got to Winnebago's. And we got to where some people stayed overnight. More anxious about his daughter's plight. See, this is the first time something like this has ever happened. So there are no ground rules. We got barbecue sets, wine, liquor. Where's your microphone? Okay, what we're going to do I'm now. sorry, we're busy. We're, we're busy now. This is one we're of the all-time great Nazi spies. <laughs> <laughs> Al Miller. Would, would I say a few words in the uh, camera? Not, not to this pa fascist pig press. <laughs> If the FBI did know, in fact, where Patty Hearst was, what exactly would you do? Well, this would depend on the facts. Uh, we don't know where Patty Hearst is. Uh, we're making no direct attempt to, to uh, find out because we don't want to get uh, Patty hurt. At the time when Charlie was special agent in charge in San Francisco, the FBI really didn't know what to do. They didn't have a clue about who these people were. This was brand new and came out of nowhere. And in a lot of ways, they looked in the wrong places. These were people who were dangerous, obviously, because they'd already murdered uh, one person. And they had set fire to a house. Uh, how big they were, underground support groups and things like this, no idea whatsoever. And, I, and that's one of the reasons that the, the Bureau sent so many people in, was to try and approach this as, as a terrorist investigation as well as a kidnap case. The U-2 was flying sorties up over the High Sierra looking at campsites and things like this during the initial search days. The tapes were sent to the CIA headquarters to, to be listened to by blind people whose hearing is extremely acute and they heard things in the background that the, the ordinary ear would never pick up. Greetings to the people and comrades, sisters and brothers. My name is Jumina and I am a general in the Sudanese Liberation Army. The Sudanese War Council has determined that communication between POW Patricia Hurst and her family will come only after the immediate creation of the necessary mechanisms whereby Russell Little and Joseph Romero can communicate via live national TV with the people and the SLA concerning the full scope of their physical health and all the conditions of their confinement. Oh man, the FBI and all them came and said, oh hell no, we're not about to let these guys go live on national television. You can forget that. Now, I'd do everything I could to get them on the air and will. Uh, they're the ones, as far as I'm concerned, whether Romero and Little uh, go on the air, if the SLA wants them to go on the air, I'd be delighted to have them go on the air. They may tell me something that I don't know. It may gradually become a a conduit in which we can talk to the SLA. I told him, you know, what you're doing is giving them 
a satisfaction. You're putting them on a pedestal that they don't belong. I am being held as a prisoner of war and not as anything else. I mean, and I'm being treated in accordance with international codes of war. And so, I mean, Dad, you shouldn't listen or believe what anybody else says about the way I'm being treated. This is the way that I am being treated. And I'm not left alone and I'm not just shoved off. So, I mean, I am fine. Also, since I am an example, and it's really important that everybody understand that, you know, I am an example and a warning. And because of this, it's very important to the SLA that I return safely. And um, so people should, should stop acting like I'm dead. And uh, mom should get out of her black dress. That doesn't help at all. And uh, let's take care of Steve and... No, just hurry. <laughs> Bye. You know, you can argue that we shouldn't have dealt with the SLA. You can argue you shouldn't deal with radical groups. You can do all those kinds of things intellectually until it becomes your daughter. And after a short period of time, Hearst said, hey, it's my daughter, we'll do whatever they want. Arrangements have been made for $2 million to be delivered to a tax-exempt charitable organization capable of making a distribution for the benefit of the poor and needy. He walked out the front door and said, Lud Kramer's going to handle the food distribution. And that was it. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Ludlow Kramer, Secretary of State of the State of Washington. This afternoon we met with the coalition. Now we discussed a program uh, the model of it has been done in the state of Washington. One of the sad parts was the number of people that they grabbed to help them that could do nothing. It is very apparent that SLA uh, has now seen fit to use us as a liaison. We made a plea for that to happen and now we are the liaison between the Hearst family and SLA. They hired a couple of people to analyze every word she said and what it really meant, not what she said, and paid them a lot of money. I'm not being starved or beaten or unnecessarily frightened. The psychics were in the house all the time, and they were doing things and getting paid to do it. And, but, uh, but again, it was grabbing. It was, it was a family, uh, no matter how powerful or great or good they may be, who knew nothing about what was happening. They had no comprehension of who they were dealing with or how they were dealing with it. And at the beginning, we didn't really know who we were dealing with either. Four days ago, we had nothing. And in four days, we've created the largest private volunteer organization in the history of this country. The SLA is correct in the sense that people need funds, that people need the additional money. We are not questioning that at all. And the 4,000 volunteers that are working on this program uh, believe the same thing. But we believe that it must be and can be an ongoing program. I went down there with Randy, and that was amazing. So you had meat here, you had produce here, you had eggs here, you had bananas, whatever, whatever. And there was just assembly lines, and at the end came out the box, as if the SLA was giving the gift, right? with their insignia, that seven-headed snake nonsense on either side. I am convinced that Patricia Hearst is going to be released. I believe that. I am also convinced that the peoples of this land who have gone hungry are going to be saved. <laughs> Those who have the corporations of our land can now see that sometimes it takes the most extreme situations to be heard, even though I disagree with the tactic of kidnapping and terrorism, people are looking like they've never looked before in America. It was what we always wanted. 
in a way, it, it was like a dream that she didn't want to wake up from because it was, first of all, it was instant gratification. They say, food program, there was a food program just like that. There was thousands of poor black people and poor Hispanics in line showing poverty in America, which is what we wanted to show for years and no one would listen. I hate to take advantage of what's been happening to the young lady. Me too. But I, I, my, my children need food just like anybody else can. Right on. We were like Robin Hood. We're coming in and we're going to feed people. And maybe this can be an ongoing program for 20 years and maybe we can do some good things and you know, all that stuff. And so, sure, you know, we didn't agree with the SLA, but we knew people were hungry. What literally happens, of course, is that because of the lack of coordination, because of the, just, the, just the chaos that, that surrounded it all, it almost comes off as a racist episode in, in which people look like damn fools fighting over a turkey. smoothly. One all hell broke loose. All of a sudden people started coming and saying, do you know that two people have been killed and murdered because you handled this so badly? People have been hurt, hurt. Mr. Kramer. One, one re reporter and he's not badly hurt. Well, it happened. So what are you going to do? I'm, carry, I'm carrying out the wishes of the family. One moment. In the future, every crime committed in connection with the kidnapping will be prosecuted, and I'm including any persons who participate in any sort of a food distribution plan or a television set distribution plan or any other kind of a distribution plan, if it's done in response to extortion or kidnapping, we'll encourage the local district attorneys to prosecute under existing law, and if they don't, we'll do it. The size of the latest demand of the SLA is far beyond my financial capability. Therefore, the matter is now out of my hand. You know something, Robin, I was just wondering? Are we good guys or bad guys? You know, I mean, uh, are robbing the rich to feed the poor? That's a naughty word. We never rob. I've been robbed. Of course you've been robbed! Mom, Dad, I've been hearing reports about the food program. So far, it sounds like you and your advisors have managed to turn it into a real disaster. You said that it was out of your hands. What you should have said was that you wash your hands of it. It sounds like most of the food is low quality. No one received any beef or lamb. Anyway, it certainly didn't sound like the kind of food our family is used to eating. Oh my God, what's this? The child is is talking down to her rich dad. I mean, this is what we all were doing for the last 10 years. Like I say, just distilled in a moment. It was like, it was like compressing matter, you know, until it's just so, you know. Like I said earlier, I can see that, that she may actually be having her doubts as to, you know, from her point of view, it may look like we've made a mess of things. What is her political point of view, would you say? Previous to the last two months, uh, I would say that she really didn't have one. Um, I think that by the time this is over, uh, she will, she's going to have some sort of a political view. She's, there's no way of getting around that. Mom, Dad. Tell the poor and oppressed people of this nation what the corporate state is about to do. Warn black and poor people that they're about to be murdered down to the last man, woman, and child. 
tell the people that the energy crisis is nothing more than a means to get public approval for a massive program to build nuclear power plants all over the nation. Tell the people that the entire corporate state is, with the aid of this massive power supply, about to totally automate the entire industrial state to the point that in the next five years, all that will be needed will be a small class of button pushers. Tell the people, Dad, that the removal of expendable excess, the removal of unneeded people, has already started. I've been given the choice of, one, being released in a safe area, or two, joining the forces of the Symbionese Liberation Army and fighting for my freedom and the freedom of all oppressed people. I have chosen to stay and fight. I have been given the name Tanya after a comrade who fought alongside Che in Bolivia. It is in the spirit of Tanya that I say, Patria o Muerte, venceremos. All of a sudden, within days, we love you, Tanya, because that's the name she chose. And it was like, uh, it, w it was just so unreal. It was, and that's all the media talked about. It just, yeah, I, I, I don't even know what to compare it with. It's just like, it was like, it was like the 49ers in 81 being all of a sudden on their way to the Super Bowl. It was a, it was magical. It was just like the home team, you know, it was like the 69 New York Mets. And it was just like, it was the ultimate David and Goliath. And it was like, they, they tell them we want food. They tell them we want better food, this, that, and they just comply and they just fold it. And it's just a few people and it, nothing ever like that had ever happened before. Everything else was a failure. Joe and I would read this stuff and just look at each other. It's like, you know, is everybody stoned? What's going on over here, you know? You don't think that she's come around thinking their way? Oh, uh, I know Patty too well to think that she's going to come around like that. I really don't. She's Why do you too, think she would say those things? I guess um, she only hears one side of the story. Uh, the whole time she's been there, she's heard one side. And she, she, maybe from where she is, she looks out and says, what's going on, you know? And she only hears one side, like I said. And she, she just doesn't know it's the whole thing. You don't believe it? No, I don't believe it. It's more or less shock over this thing, and until we know more about it, we haven't anything to say. Uh, I think, and I don't remember all the details, but I think that's the only time he cried. That really broke his heart. You had people who were telling him she's been brainwashed. So they had that rock to hold on to. Until she walks in the door and tells them personally uh, that she's a member of the SLA, common sense dictates that you have to accept that she is still uh, being held prisoner by the SLA. If she is not, there's no reason in the world why she cannot come and make this statement in person and walk back out the door as her parents said she could. We spoke to a lot of people who had become familiar with this phenomenon, the so-called Stockholm Syndrome, in which people get kidnapped and identify with their kidnappers. The thesis of the, of the Stockholm Syndrome is that every day your captor lets you live, you more closely identify with that captor, up until even uh, sexual attraction. And to me, she was a classic Stockholm Syndrome case. If I would have been there, if I would have been part of the kidnapping, no, no, God, no. I can't imagine letting her stay. I mean, I know she, her and Willie, you know, they were in love and all this other stuff, and she was pissed off at her parents. Will you come with me? To Sherwood? I have nothing to offer you but a life of hardship and danger, but we'd be together. Because I love you, Robin, I'd come. Even a danger would mean nothing if you were with me. As for my ex fiance the fact is, I don't care if I ever see him again. 
During the last few months, Stephen has shown himself to be a sexist, ageist pig. I, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not in any particular right frame of mind, perhaps, to be talking now. I just finished listening to the tape a few minutes ago. But it seemed important to me to say some things that I'm feeling right now and not think about them too much and screw it up. Uh, it, the SLA has said that they are the instrument of the people, and yet the will of the people has certainly been, at least lately, that, and the will of the two captured soldiers has been to give Patty her freedom. Uh, I'm reconciled, reconciled to the idea that Patty must have matured a great deal in the past two months. I just want to tell Patty that I love her as much as ever, and, uh, and I think she knows that I can accept whatever she has chosen, and even though it, it may be hard for me, I, I can accept it. It was just like total Hollywood, but I guess the whole thing had turned into Hollywood, so why shouldn't it be Hollywood for her too? You know, yeah, I'll go join uh, Robin Hood. Combat operation, April 15th, 1974, the year of the children. Action, appropriation. 138 Smith & Wesson revolver, condition good. Five rounds of 158 grain, 30 caliber ammo. Number of rounds fired by combat forces, seven rounds. Number of rounds lost, five. Casualties, people's forces, none. Enemy forces, none. Civilian, two. Reasons. Subject one, male. Subject was ordered to lay on the floor face down. Subject refused order and jumped out the front door of the bank. Therefore, the subject was shot. Subject two, male. Subject failed or did not hear a warning to clear the street. Subject was running down the street towards the bank and combat forces accordingly assumed subject was an armed enemy force element. Therefore, the subject was shot. It was Bonnie and Clyde. It was all that kind of thing that's very American, actually, at the core. It's just like these guys were just doing it so artistically. Hibernia Bank, Sunset Branch, was held up at gunpoint this morning at 9.40. $10,960 was taken in cash. Witnesses state five of the bank robbers entered the bank while four remained outside. All made a getaway in two automobiles after firing several shots from automatic weapons. In addition, Patricia Campbell Hurst has been named in a federal warrant charging her with being a material witness to the bank robbery. At this point, we are simply saying we want to talk to Patricia Hurst. I took the tape of uh, Patricia Hurst in the bank robbery over to the uh, Berkeley School for the Deaf, and they read her lips as to what she was saying in the bank. I'm Tanya, up, up, up against the wall, and everybody giggled because they couldn't say it. And I said, MF, and they said, yeah, that's it. 
If that was Patty Hearst, she had her hand on that gun. That she did have her hands on the, on the trigger and ready to shoot anything that got in her way. Greetings to the people. This is Tanya. Our action of April 15th forced the corporate state to help finance the revolution. As for being brainwashed, the idea is ridiculous to the point of being beyond belief. I am a soldier in the people's army. The FBI looked like a bunch of idiots. You know, here they couldn't find this little band of kids. They couldn't catch these people. You know, they were putting out these communiques. They were forcing this stuff to be fed live, unedited, to the whole country. Sure, they were pissed, man. They wanted them dead. B team commander and all elements of the anti aircraft forces of the SLA. This is Tico speaking. The Malcolm X combat unit of the Symbionese Liberation Army left the San Francisco Bay Area in a successful effort to break a massive pig encirclement. It had become clear through intelligence reports that the pigs were preparing to trap us on the San Francisco Peninsula. The area is very small, surrounded by water and with limited choices for breaking a major encirclement. A nighttime raid on this apartment house gave the FBI its first big break in the three-month search for the Symbionese Liberation Army. Inside the apartment, abandoned last week, agents found terrorist slogans signed by Field Marshal Sin Q and also by Tanya, the name taken by Patty Hearst. They went to Los Angeles. They left a message for the FBI and Charlie, you know, and said, you know, beat you again, see you later, and took off. You assume that happy hunting Charles was directed at you that was written on that wall? I don't know, I haven't seen that. I, uh, there are a lot of people named Charles, Charlie. Uh, <laughs> uh, I haven't uh, lost any sleep over it. DeFreeze made some mention of like psychological warfare against the police. You know, it was like trying to fake the police out. But you know, it seemed like he totally lost track of that. Well, are you doing this for the police? Is it communicate for the police? Or is it to try to explain to people what you're doing? I mean, who is it for? They seem to have lost, you know, sight of, you know, who are you trying to communicate with? Why would you even worry about the police? Who cares what they think? They hate you. They want to kill you. A lot of this is fantasy in their mind. I mean, they, they're, they're living out a fantasy that's Peter Pan. It was like watching a movie, and there's the, you know, there's the gang that we want to win. You know, it was, oh, we were pulling for them so much. But it wasn't like, you know, where do we go to join up or anything like that. They could not carry on what they were doing in Los Angeles. It was a different culture, and they soon found that out. DeFries might have tried to convince them he knew about Los Angeles, but he didn't. He was from Cleveland. On the late afternoon of May 16, 1974, at Mel's Sporting Goods Store, Inglewood, California, William Harris attempted to shoplift a pair of socks. As William and Emily Harris departed Mel's Sporting Goods, a scuffle ensued after which the store employees were the target of fire from a van parked across the street. Patricia Hurst fired the shots at Mel's Sporting Goods. Had not been the lifting of a pair of sweat socks, did you have any indication that they had gone to L.A.? No, we had none. As of that time, no. Well, Mr. Bates, are you saying that you had no idea that they had moved to Los Angeles? That's right. That's pretty incredible, isn't is it? Is it incredible? We interviewed the people in the neighborhood where they went to, the 
people who they'd stayed with. Uh, they were still so stoned out on reds, you know, they could barely keep their eyes open. <laughs> but uh, they turned them in too, you know, and uh, you know, don't burn my house down because you can't get free a revolution. That was the attitude. Yes, you do indeed know me. You have always known me. I'm that nigga you have hunted and feared night and day. I'm that nigga you have killed hundreds of my people in a vain hope of finding. I'm that nigga that is no longer just a hunted, robbed, and murdered. I'm the nigga that hunts you now. Yes, you know me. You know us all. You know me. I'm the wetback. You know me. I'm the gook, the broad, the servant, the spick. Yes, indeed, you know us all, and we know you, the oppressor, murderer, and robber. And you have hunted and robbed and exploited us all. Now we are the hunters that will give you no rest and will not compromise the freedom of our children. Death to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people. They are getting ready for an assault, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, before we stop counting, there's another. About five plainclothes police cars have, have moved in on the corner, on Compton Avenue here, with officers with weapons, loaded weapons. Ah, now more officers are moving right into the position where we were, so they must be getting ready. There's no, there's no doubt about that in my mind. Maybe the people inside the house are thinking that's like when the San Francisco police say, give up. It means you don't have to right away. But in L.A. it meant you had to right away. That white house with the two windows that we can see there? As far as I can determine, you've got as close as I have. That's bad. That's bad. Stay on there. Stay on those side of the street. This was right at the time when the technology changed in, in television. I mean, this, I, as far as I know, this is the first time you know, a, a something like that that wasn't a planned event uh, was actually carried live nationwide. I mean, the whole world is watching this, this shootout. So there's no reason to believe we're going to be able to get loose here for a while. We're going to be stuck. We're going to turn down here for a long time. Have you ever had a situation in which you have a condition, like I said before, when the left doesn't know when it's won? If the SLA had thought about it at all, they'd won. They could have given up and made a speech right there. They had the whole world listening to them, and they decided to fight it out. <laughs> One person was brought out. We haven't seen anyone else come out of there. Of course, we're not 
really in the position to have seen them, but I believe they would have brought them around this corner and down if they had. Right. And of course, the obvious conclusion is that the Los Angeles police have indeed found the nesting place of uh, the Symbionese Liberation Army, and there's not much left of it now. They just went in and killed everybody. Joe and I heard the whole thing. We couldn't see anything where we were. We didn't have TVs or anything like that. But we heard the whole shootout. And we kept hoping it wasn't them at first, you know. Once we heard them firing thousands of rounds of ammunition and shooting high temperature tear gas grenades in there and setting the place on fire, I mean, eventually we. You know, we realize it, it must be them. And we figure, you know, it's like we figure, well, this is, this is it. You know, this is what we were afraid of. And now it's happened. of the SLA hideout. Dr. Thomas Noguchi just called uh, the Hearst residence and talked with Mr. Hearst just a few minutes ago, and he told Mr. Hearst that um, they have examined all of the five bodies taken uh, from that house in Los Angeles, and uh, the conclusion they have reached uh, exactly is that Patty Hearst was not, I repeat, was not in that house yesterday. They knew that Hearst was not in that house. That was all bullshit. They knew because of the way that Bill and Emily and Hearst had gotten away and the paths they had taken everything and when they had surrounded that house and put it under surveillance and all that, they knew she wasn't there. That was all bullshit. It was quite certain that the Harrises and Patty had not gotten back to the residence down there. Why there was no negotiation? It's not by the boat. It's not by the boat. Did they start shooting from the inside out first? I don't know. They don't teach you that in the hostage negotiation courses. That's for damn sure. I think if, if, if you take a poll in the Los Angeles area that the citizens would not only be supportive of the way the uh, uh, the police handle it. My, my feeling is that the, their feeling is one of admiration for the way the police handle it. I know that there were some people who said, well, gee, instead of telling them to come out in five minutes, they should have given them ten minutes. Somebody else uh, suggested they should have starved them out. Well, you know, they, these may be well-meaning people, but I think they forget the setting in which the police operated. Greetings to the people. This is Tanya. I want to talk about the way I knew our six murdered comrades, because the fascist pig media has, of course, been painting a typically distorted picture of these beautiful sisters and brothers. Sin Q was in a race with time, believing that every minute must be another step forward in the fight to save the children. Jelena was beautiful. She taught me how to fight the enemy within, through her constant struggle with bourgeois conditioning. Gabi crouched low with her ass to the ground. She practiced until her shotgun was an extension of her right and left arms. Zoya, female gorilla, perfect love and perfect hate reflected in stone-cold eyes. Faiza taught me to shoot first and make sure the pig is dead before splitting. She was wise and bad. Kujo, was the gentlest, most beautiful man I've ever known. He taught me the truth as he learned it from the beautiful brothers in California's concentration camps. Neither Cujo or I had ever loved an individual the way we loved each other. Our relationship's foundation was our commitment to the struggle and our love for the people. I died in that fire on 54th Street, but out of the ashes I was reborn. I know what I have to do.
about the atrocity that took place in Los Angeles. I'm really angry, so if people have to bear with me, I'm still angry for what I saw and the things I've heard that went down in Los Angeles on Saturday afternoon. You know, I want to deal with the beginning. You know, it takes the actions of SLA to feed poor people in this state, you know, throughout the state, the United States of North America. It, it's going to take many more SLAs to come along and deal with the fascist elements in this fascist, racist country that we are confronted with as so-called American citizens. Here's the most notorious kidnap victim in the world, traveling with the two best-known kidnappers in the world, and yet uh, they slide into Berkeley unnoticed and are given safe refuge almost immediately. Thank you, Willie, Camilla, Miss Moon, and Vahisa were viciously attacked and murdered by 500 pigs in L.A. while the whole nation watched. And now the media is trying to say they were trying to escape by tunneling under the houses where they had chickened out at the last minute. Well, I believe that Jelena and her comrades fought till the last minute. And though I would like to have her be here with me right now, I know that she lived and she died happy. And SLA soldiers, although I know it's not necessary to say, keep fighting. I'm with you. And we are with you. Right on. The door could have knocked with Emily or Bill or Patty Harris saying, God, they're trying to kill us, we need help. They could have knocked on a 200 doors in Berkeley and 150 of them would have hit them out. We were just the ones that happened to have the door knocked. Bill becomes the new, the new leader. Uh, of the SLA. He's the surviving male guy, the, the authority figure, and he wants to be uh, the new general field marshal. Uh, so General Tico takes over. I'd have to say that once I met all three of them, I was kind of disappointed in how flat they were. They didn't seem to be that smart. It wasn't a fingernail of charisma among the three of them. That was kind of dawning on me, how middle class they all seemed. I renounced my class privilege when Sin and Cujo gave me the name Tanya. And I would never choose to live the rest of my life surrounded by pigs like the Hursts. I just hope everybody will remember that physically, Patty is still a kidnapped victim. She was taken away against her will. And psychologically, she's a victim of thought control by terrorists. And all I can do is hope and pray that God will bring her home again. Death to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people. To this day, I can't understand why the need was felt to keep on with this kind of militaristic fantasy. Just end it and be done with it, and good luck. as soon as they entered the bank, announced that it was a holdup. Everyone to get down on the floor, put their faces in the rug, and with that, a shot rang out, hitting Mrs. Upsall. The leader of the group told everyone in the bank if they didn't cooperate, they would receive the same in return. With that, two of the individuals vaulted the counter, started scooping up the cash, they were kicking the people in the head, stepping on their faces, and just shouting profanity throughout. There was nothing left to be gained by the SLA at the point of that Carmichael bank robbery, except money.
I think the killing scared hell out of them. Not just because it would mean the police were after them more, but because it was a, it was an immoral thing to have happened. It was not a, something they meant to do. And I think that bothers, bothered them more than people realize. I have family in the world. I have friends in the world. I don't want to be thought of as a murderer. I don't want to be thought of as, as some, as some fucking maniac that goes and shoots up a bank, acting like a radical. Leave a woman to die like that? Now, if you're asking me, well, someone did that, obviously. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. If you ask me, can I say 100% that Jim or Kathy or Patty or the Harrises or Wendy uh, did or did not do it? I can't say. It looks like there's some involvement there, isn't there? It looks like on s somewhere along the line, but I don't know. They lied about me that bad. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't honestly say on the stand. I mean, how am I going to know who, who is or who is not involved if I'm really not involved, you know? But, uh, and I don't really care. I, I don't care. At 2.25 p.m., less than 30 minutes ago, we arrested Patty Hurst at 625 Morse in the outer Mission District. We did observe two people who looked like they could be Bill and Emily Harris. And as a result, the arrest was made. herself who gave a clue that she is a far different person now than the 19 year old girl who was kidnapped 19 months ago when asked for her occupation while being booked she told the officer urban gorilla and all these naive radicals just hearing what they wanted to hear basically you know they wanted to, a rich person to convert to their cause she was just they just had a mutual agenda for a little while. That's all it was, as it turns out. You know, we were all fooled. I don't believe Patty's legal problems are that serious. After all, she's primarily a kidnap victim. She never went off into anything of her own free will. It is probably the mystery story of the 20th century, and it finally unfolded today, one version of it, Patty Hearst's own version of it, here at the federal courthouse in San Francisco as the whole world watched. It unfolded in this shocking, chilling, and deeply moving affidavit filed by Patty Hearst herself through her attorneys. She was placed in a closet on the floor. The closet was approximately five to six feet in length, and about two and a half or three feet in width. During all this time, she was in a constant state of fear and terror and expected at any moment to be murdered by her captors. After an interminable length of time, which seemed to her to be weeks, she was released from the closet and seated with the gang of captors. When the blindfold was removed, she felt as if she were on an LSD trip. Everything appeared so distorted and terrible that she believed and feared she was losing her sanity. She was put in an automobile and taken to a site which she now understands was a branch of the Hibernia Bank. She was given a gun and directed to stand about in the center of the bank counter. Meanwhile, one of her captors, armed with a gun which was kept pointed at her, kept an eye on her and had told her in advance that if she made one false move or did anything except announce her name, she would be killed instantly. 
When she was taken back to her place of captivity, she was told by them that she was now guilty of bank robbery and murder, and that the FBI would shoot her on sight. In her disordered and frightened mind, this appeared to her to be probable, and it was so insisted upon by members of the gang that she finally came to believe it. The recollection of everything that transpired up to the time that she was arrested has been as though she lived in a fog in which she was confused, still unable to distinguish between actuality and fantasy. Part of the dilemma of understanding Patricia Hearst in this whole thing is that there are so many obvious opportunities she had to simply walk down the street, hail a cab, get in a car, uh, uh, call her father, call me, anybody, you know, and it was over. Uh, she never did. Quite a difference from last time, and thank you all. And I'm really happy to be going home. And I want to thank my parents and my sisters and Bernie and George too, <laughs> and all of the people on the committee to release me. And this is what we worked so hard to get. Thank you all so much. Bye bye. Yeah, I am. Where you going? Bye bye. Oh, I won't tell. <laughs> as far as changing the whole society goes, it was always a pipe dream. The true communist state where everybody is a brother to everybody else and we all share everything and you know everybody lives happily ever after. I mean, I would have been fine with that, but yeah, I know I'm older now. People they're working, they're paying their mortgage, they're worrying about their kids, you know. I mean, you know, but when you're you know, when you're twenty one, twenty two, twenty three years old, I was twenty four years old when I got arrested. You know, people talk about Hearst was only nineteen. Hey, we were all young. Four former Symbionese Liberation Army members accused of murdering a Carmichael woman during a bank robbery in 1975 plead guilty today. In court, four of the SLA members who pulled off the heist apologized 27 years after Myrna Opsal was killed during a bank robbery in Carmichael. Each of these defendants entered a plea of guilty to murder in the second degree. In addition, Mr. Harris admitted that he was armed during the commission of the crime. This is the time and the place for judgment and sentence. When we finish today, the defendants will be remanded into custody to serve sentences in state prison. As I stated uh, the last time, um, the fact that uh, Mrs. Oxall was murdered and unintentionally in the bank is of no consequence to the family and the fact that we beat ourselves up more than anyone could and really alienated ourselves from what we believed in and ostracized ourselves. And that's probably the saddest thing about these kind of cases, whether you're well-intentioned or poor-intentioned or not, is uh, there's not a good result. A woman 
his dad and many people suffer from those consequences. And uh, I can offer nothing but my apologies and I'm sorry. Montague will be sentenced to eight years in prison. Mr. Harris will be sentenced to seven years in prison. Ms. Olson will be sentenced to six years in prison. Mr. Borton will be sentenced to six years in prison. Now, my next guest went from kidnap victim to terrorist. She was once the most wanted woman in America. <laughs> It, it is truly remarkable to meet you because you you are a part of all our history it's something that it intrigues everybody mm -hmm. um, just to get an idea of why the kidnap happened I mean you were the the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst mm -hmm. um, you, your your family were supremely rich um, what what was your childhood like what was life like living like that well it was great I mean <laughs> It was, um, I, you know, I think it was really pretty perfect. 